Uh, so hi, I'm Nathan Roach, uh, who is going to talk about uh, our work characterizing SARS-CoV-2 using long read RNA or well long read DNA and RNA sequencing. Uh, this work was largely done by Wolfgang Meyer, uh, but I'm going to be talking about it as Wolfgang uh, presented last week. Um, so if you could go to the next slide. So I think uh, you've probably seen this slide before if you've been watching these webinars, but um, uh, I, I am part of the COVID-19 analysis group uh, as part of the Galaxy Project. Uh, all of the analysis that I'm going to be talking about today can be found in one of the pages on this covid19.galaxyproject.org page. Um, and there's six different types of analyses that are hosted on this, on this page um, across a number of different servers. Um, the analysis is ongoing, but feel free to uh, check this out and uh, kind of dig into the analysis if you're interested. Uh, if you could go to the next slide. So part of the analysis that I just talked about in the previous slide is um, uh, looking at genomic uh, variation of SARS-CoV-2. And so we've uh, put together a number of workflows uh, that do that, this for whole genome sequencing uh, Illumina data, uh, as well as Arctic data, uh, prepared data for Illumina and for nanopore uh, sequencing. Um, so kind of the, the, much of the kind of extra, uh, much of the side branches of the workflow are the same between these different uh, analyses, but the kind of core changes depending on the modality used. Uh, and I'm gonna be talking primarily about the Oxford Nanopore data today. Um, and so for alignment and variant calling for this workflow, we used Minimap and Medaka respectively. Uh, Minimap is kind of the gold standard uh, long read aligner at the moment. And Medaka is uh, a, a very good uh, variant caller for long read in particular, or for Oxford Nanopore data. Um, it is a uh, neural net based variant caller uh, that operates on the um, alignments directly. Um, and part of the reason that we use Medaka is because uh, for many of these publicly available sequencing data sets, there's not the kind of raw squiggle, um, raw fast five files available. And so uh, using something like um, Nanopolish is not an option for this data. Um, so if you could move to the next slide. So uh, kind of all of the workflows that we put together for uh, Oxford uh, for variant calling kind of operate under the same framework, which is call as many variants as you reasonably can, and then use soft filters to kind of filter down those variants into what we think are probably real and get rid of the more questionable variants. Um, and so all of these kind of have similar approaches to soft filtering. Um, and then from there, we can go into reporting and, and analysis and kind of interactive uh, analyses um, using these output variance files. Uh, if you could go to the next slide. So this is kind of what the workflow for the Oxford Nanopore data actually looks like. So we start, uh, we take the reads in and filter them based on their length. The reason that we do this is um, for Arctic data, uh, that's an amplicon-based approach, and so you wouldn't expect the amplicons to be above uh, a certain size. And so uh, while it might be interesting for other analyses, we're not particularly interested in that for this particular analysis. Um, we map those reads to the SARS-CoV-2 genome using Minimap2, filter for mapped reads. We then trim the uh, Arctic primers off those reads uh, or off those mapped reads. Um, the reason that we do this is uh, so if you include the primers, um, the Arctic primers, uh, regions in these, in these different reads, you can get uh, kind of very, uh, you can get biases towards um, the primer uh, them itself as opposed to the actual real variation there. Um, and so we use IVAR trim to do that. Uh, we then left align these alignments um, so that all the uh, in indels are left aligned. And then we uh, generate a consensus and call variants on these alignments using Medaka. So the Medaka consensus tool generates, uh, I think it's an HTF5 file that uh, has probabilities of different bases of each position. And then the variant does calling tool uses the neural net to actually do the, do the variant calling is my understanding. Um, so from there, we filter these variants using Lowfreak uh, filtering, um, 
and then we uh, annotate these variants. And in addition to all this, we're doing QC outputs using multi-QC, uh, Santos stats, and QualiMap band QC. Um, so this gives us a list of variants. And uh, from here, we can, if we can go to the next slide, uh, we can output these variants and use these to do a number of uh, interesting things. So we can generate consensus FASTAs, consensus FASTAs. Uh, we can um, generate VCF files and throw those the downstream variant analysis uh, tools. And we can generate reports that we can then do kind of data exploration with. Uh, and so some of the people in the COVID group for Galaxy have been putting together like observable notebooks that can do interactive um, analyses of these kind of in real time uh, in, the, in a web browser. Um, so yeah, so this is great. Uh, we can get variants out of long reads, uh, but there's kind of other things that we might want to do with long reads. In particular, we might want to be interested, we might be interested in looking at the transcriptome of SARS-CoV-2. Um, and so if we can go to the next slide. Sorry, if we can go to the next slide. Did not load it. Oh, there we go. Um, okay, so the transcriptome of SARS-CoV-2, um, we, we might be interested in that with examining that with long reads. And one of the things that we might be interested in here is looking at genomic versus subgenomic RNAs and being able to bin the subgenomic RNAs into which, which subgenomic RNAs we think, bin the reads into which subgenomic RNA we think they came from. So uh, for a little bit of a primer on the biology here, um, the RNAs, the plus sense uh, uh, RNAs of SARS-CoV-2 kind of come in either genomic or subgenomic RNA um, uh, forms. And then uh, uh, the negative sense there's uh, is largely used for um, for templating the production of these other uh, of these plus sense strands, uh, plus sense uh, genomic and subgenomic RNAs. And so during the replication process of these uh, plus sense RNA strands, um, you see these TRSB sub uh, uh, sections uh, that are labeled here. Uh, those are transcription regulatory sequences in the body of the genome. Uh, and at, during the replication of these plus sense strands uh, off the minus sense template, what will happen is uh, there will be a template switching event in which uh, the, the body TRS uh, kind of gets switched with the leader TRS at the, at the front uh, five prime end of the sequence. And you'll get, uh, it's not technically splicing, but it's effectively splicing of the, of the leader sequence to the subgenomic RNA. And so if you're interested in binning these reads into these subgenomic RNAs, for example, if you uh, want to do, uh, want to look at RNA um, modifications, like Milad is going to talk about a little later, and, and are interested in, well, are there some modifications that occur in, uh, in this subgenomic RNA, but not this one, um, you want to be able to bin those reads. And so the way that you would do this is with uh, the workflows that I'm going to talk about in a second. Um, so if we can go to the next slide. So the way that we basically do this is we map these reads um, to the SARS-CoV-2 genome. Uh, we start by mapping um, to um, uh, both the SARS-CoV-2 genome and the human genome. Uh, we then filter for the reads that align to uh, the SARS-CoV-2 genome. Um, we uh, filter just for primary alignments, I believe, um, because, uh, because we are, that might be in the later step. I think that's in the later step. So then we, we pull out these, um, uh, these alignments, uh, pull out the, the sequences of these alignments, and then remap them to the SARS-CoV-2 genome only using uh, spliced alignment, um, particularly, we, we don't use the, the defaults for the spliced alignment because the defaults for spliced alignment weight towards GTAG splice sites, which we don't want to do uh, because this isn't canonical splicing or even technically splicing. Um, so we, we align with the uh, splice mode on, but without the weighting to GTAG splice sites. Um, and then we pull out just the primary alignments here 
uh, and then feed this into the next workflow, which uh, if you could go to the next slide. So this is the workflow that does kind of the heavy lifting of binning these uh, reads into which uh, subgenomic RNA we think they belong to. Uh, and the gist of this workflow is basically we have a bed file that specifies each of the uh, TRSB sites, each of the transcription regulatory sequences in the body of the, of the um, uh, genomic RNA. Uh, and we uh, filter basically in kind of a progressive way. So uh, we start by filtering for things that overlap with the leader transcription regulatory sequence. And then we say it has to overlap with that and not overlap with the ORF1AB section up until the first TRSB site. And then we filter again for, it has to not overlap with up through TRSB, the next TRSB site. And we continually do that until we have uh, reads filtered um, for each of the TRSB sites. Uh, and have effectively binned these. And, and once we have all these reads binned into which, uh, which subgenomic RNA they came from, we uh, can go and do some of the analysis that Malad is gonna talk about uh, next. So I'll hand it off to Malad now and if you could move to the next slide. So hello everyone, thank you for participating in this Elixir webinar. And uh, thanks also Nate for uh, the great introduction and going through the field. Uh, so here I would like to talk about specifically the RNA modifications as a follow up of the uh, step of the separating and classifying and binning the subgenomic RNAs. This is a joint work and also in, to some degree an ongoing work with Jonas, Wolfgang, Ruff and uh, Björn. And uh, so with this, could you please go to the next slide please? First about the coronaviruses, as you are likely know, is like that the coronaviruses are uh, part of the beta coronavirus genus. And uh, I mean, uh, beta coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2 is, is a member of the beta coronavirus genus and the coronavirus group is this, all these members of these families where uh, the, one of the common characteristic is that they have a positive sense single stranded RNA genome, as you see, uh, on the left, and uh, we know uh, a, a handful of these uh, viruses and of this uh, uh, group that can infect humans and cause disease. So, and then right also you see that this, this uh, famous or so say infamous structure of the, uh, the coronaviruses where in the core we have the genomic RNA, which is uh, compact with the structural RNAs. Uh, with several more than 13 uh, open reading frames, as you see on the bottom. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Uh, as Nate also mentioned, I mean, the coronaviruses uh, have a cycle which produces complex nested composition of subgenomic RNAs uh, using the genome as a template. Uh, for doing so, uh, the, the virus goes uh, after entry uh, to, the, to the cell and being expanded, it uses the, uh, the translation machinery of the, uh, of the host uh, to, uh, to translate the first part, almost the first two thirds of the, uh, the genome, uh, what, of one A and B. And what is happening is as the, after the proteolysis of these uh, proteins, the, the machinery to uh, starting replicating the, the whole virus plus also the transcription of the subgenomic RNA is starting. And as a result of all this complex process, which is going back and forth between the uh, positive and negative temp uh, strand, we get uh, the whole genome uh, uh, plus the subgenomic RNAs, uh, which act as a, so to say, the messenger RNAs, which are kind of pseudo spliced. Uh, in, uh, and then these elements will be again assembled and packed and the new uh, virus will be replicated using uh, this uh, uh, transcribed uh, and replicated genomes and subgenomic RNAs. Uh, could you go to the next slide, please? So, and now about the RNA modification. So, after transcription, almost in, in, in 
actually in all the antigens of the, uh, the life and also including the viruses after the transcription of the RNA, there are enzymes within the host or I mean from the cell where they target the RNA and they can introduce a variety of modifications uh, to the biochemistry of the nuclear bases of these uh, canonical ACG use that we are aware of. Uh, up to today, more than uh, 170 types of modifications has been discovered. Some of these modifications uh, have a strong uh, phenotypes where uh, they can be are associated with the diseases uh, and through several mechanisms such as changing the stability of the um, messenger RNAs or through uh, impacting the translation of the mRNAs uh, and the non-coding RNAs within the genome. Uh, as you see on the right, this variety is happening because of the complexity of the nuclear bases that we have, uh, where each of these changes through the enzymes, uh, through the processes which are conserved, uh, cause these uh, uh, modifications which are necessary for the function of uh, the, the cellular mechanism. And also the virus can also hijack these mechanisms for its own benefit. Uh, could you go to the next slide, please? Uh, there are several ways to actually detect these RNA modifications. One of the uh, quite more uh, modern uh, ways of detecting the position of these modifications is by using the direct RNA sequencing using Oxford nanopore technology. Here, the, the, the principal idea is that the nascent uh, uh, RNAs without doing any kind of PCR amplification and template copying uh, will go through a, 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 a preparation protocol where then eventually this uh, strand of uh, in vivo extracted RNAs go through a pore uh, where this pore, the unicorns of this uh, pore will be uh, measured uh, by the sequencing uh, machine and we get these signals. This signal will be first principally used for to doing the base calling, that means to identify the canonical bases and these devices from Nanopore range from the Minion uh, devices or smaller ones, which are handheld to larger desk, uh, desktop size uh, devices. Here you see an example of the Minion, which is connected to uh, a laptop and does live uh, the sequencing as well as the base calling step, which is presented on the right side, which is principally a machine learning technique for uh, decoding through these complex uh, currents, which is also stochastic uh, signals uh, to the canonical basis. However, as I mentioned, we, we could adhere this information to not only detected canonical basis, but also see the disparities according to the reference expected uh, signal, as you see on the bottom right, that uh, if we have the canonical uh, basis of the sequence here mentioned as a control read, that we are sure that no modification is happening and compare it with the, what we get from the, the cells. By comparing these two signals, we can see in the regions which are, there is a disparity that's an, uh, a signal for an RNA editing and RNA modification such that uh, due to the changes which could be either minor or uh, um, major changes to the basis, we expect that the signals would be changing. So, so this gives us, uh, uh, as, uh, could you go back please? Uh, just to say that this, so this is the modification detection we do. And also the other advantage is that because we are uh, really measuring and quantifying the nascent RNAs without doing any PCR, uh, amplification, then we could get a better idea of the, without any uh, biases about, for example, GC content of the relative rate of uh, different transcripts from the sample. Thank you. Could you go next one? Thank you. Uh, so for doing uh, this processing of the direct, direct RNA sequencing data and modification, uh, as uh, Nate mentioned, the first step is to characterize and identify the subgenomic and genomic RNAs. Uh, afterwards, then we have, there are several tools actually in the market and also uh, it's an really an ongoing underdeveloping uh, progress going on for the tools to, to, to have a better accuracy and specificity in detecting the modifications. Could you please uh, make another click? As a part of the, uh, the task force for the COVID-19 in Galaxy, 
after implementing uh, these uh, workflows in other workflow management systems and extending the previous works, we, we extended them uh, to be part of the uh, Galaxy. Uh, could you please go to the next one? Thank you. So as you see, uh, Nick already mentioned about the, the read alignment and assignment. And also on the right, you see just an overview of these implementations for the two of the uh, tools that can uh, detect uh, the modifications, namely non compor and Tombow. I don't go to the very details of each of these steps, but if we just go to the next slide, then you could see an overview of the entire uh, process here. Uh, and on the top, we see this, uh, this uh, subgenomic and genomic read binning, where the reads from the infected cell are mapped to the host and virus genome. And then uh, using this way, we plus the, uh, the complex part of uh, identifying the subgenomic reads, we can classify the viral RNA reads to separate them from the host uh, reads, plus also uh, uh, subcategorize them to the genomic and subgenomic viral reads. On the bottom, you see uh, a general uh, perspective of how the RNA modification detection works. In one pass, uh, we, we have the control reads that we know that there is no modification. If we go to the bottom, then we see, okay, we can compare this signal, the signal of this distribution of these control reads with the viral reads uh, to come up with the modification scores. Here, the idea is like that by comparing the distributions or uh, st statistics of this Rates per position, we can identify the disparities and disparities hint for an editing and modification of the basis. However, there is also another approach where it is based on uh, uh, training uh, stat statistical and also machine learning models where the control rates can be used to train a model, which is a canonical based model. Also, these models are typically provided by the tools. So it is a, a step is optional, but recommended step. And then the, the viral rates here, the viral reads in general, also the reads uh, under study of the, the condition under study will be compared and matched to see how, how well they would match to, uh, to the reads of the model. And uh, the less that they match to the expectation of the model is a sign that uh, this read doesn't match to the expected signal. And that's also another way to uh, calculate the modification scores. Uh, the next slide, please. So here I just provide a rough overview of uh, the results, uh, which is based on our work and also the works of the others. It's also quite an under uh, development uh, result. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the uh, information that we get, as I mentioned, is to get an unbiased quantification of the transcriptome uh, rates. Uh, as you see here in the, in the pie charts, more than 60% of the uh, reads uh, which are extracted uh, from the infected cells belong to the virus, which shows that uh, how efficient and uh, uh, complex is this uh, replication and transcription machinery of the virus to hijack uh, the machinery of the, the host for its own benefit. Uh, from the different types of the uh, subgenomic RNAs which are uh, extracted, the N, which is the shortest uh, type of open reading frames and also important part of the structural proteins, have uh, the highest uh, uh, ratio of the transcription. This is also expected because that's the shortest part and also the first part which is used for the template. Uh, of the uh, of the virus, and on top of that, I should also mention that there is a bit of uh, technological bias here because the, the reads which are uh, obtained from the direct RNA sequencing, uh, which is a so delicate uh, protocol, uh, tends to be easier to sequence the shorter reads than the longer reads. But nevertheless, beside that, also uh, we see that this trend of uh, the uh, difference rates of the uh, subgenomic RNA reads ratios. Uh, could you go to the next slide, please? Uh, so coming to the results of the RNA modification, what you see on the left is uh, the highest, uh, one of the uh, highly modified regions of the, the virus. As you can see uh, by comparing the black, which is the control reads from the in vitro transcript data, which is expected to not, not have any modification and compare them with the signal that we get 
uh, in the red from the three replicates. And what you see on, on the y-axis is the ionic currents. And you see uh, by mapping this information to the positions, we see that there is a disparity in this region, which hints for a potential modification. Uh, importantly, also, although there, is, although there is a bit of variation in the level of uh, modification rate uh, estimated for the three samples, they have a very high correlation, more than 85% uh, uh, correlation coefficient is, is the correlation coefficient between the three samples that we have used uh, for uh, doing the sequencing. Also, I should mention that uh, we have used the uh, the lung human cell lines, uh, which is a kind of natural uh, host and one of the first entry points of the virus uh, for the infection. Uh, one of the other information that we could see on the bottom left is like that uh, the enrichment of uh, the type of the, uh, the K-MERS, which are enriched and the modification size. And you can see they are typically air enriched with also a bit of guanine and also cytosine. Uh, nevertheless, uh, there is no uh, strong uh, uh, motif enrichment for, uh, uh, for, for, the, for the sites that we could see. On the right, you see that the comparison between the, uh, this, the, lung, the modifications and the lung cell line with the previous work by Kim et al. for the kidney uh, cell lines. And still we see, even though these two are uh, quite varying and different uh, types of cells, the modifications which are predicted for by these two uh, cell lines are quite uh, compatible. And also there is a high varying level of modification such that it seems that uh, it, uh, there is a blob of uh, modifications around uh, 20 to 30%, which means that it is not, uh, not all the transcripts in the host cell are, have gone through the enzymic modifications. This information can be also used to separate uh, the modifications uh, on the, on the, depending on the, uh, to, to identify at which stage of the transcription and replication uh, the cell and the reads are. Could you go please to the next slide? Thank you. Here, I would just uh, stick to the overview is like that here, what you see is the, using the nanocompore on the left uh, heat map and also Tombo on the right uh, side, uh, we see how uh, the, these sites of modification are distributed uh, among, around, along the genome and also subgenomic RNA. So each row corresponds to one uh, subgenomic RNA on the left. And the two rows on the right correspond to two different replicates of, uh, of the SARS-CoV-2, but using two different techniques. On the right is the Tombo, and then the ref uh, is uh, nanocompore. Where with the nanocompore, we have a direct comparison of the uh, mode of the modification. On the right side, we have the model-based modification. Despite having a, a, a large, dif uh, a strong difference in the way that these two calculations has happened, we see a, st a statistically significant overlap uh, of the top modified sites, which means that uh, we don't have strong uh, um, uh, model biases here and the methodological biases to identify the modifications. Uh, what you see on the bottom right is zooming into the site in the frame shift element, uh, which is a pseudonut, uh, presumably a pseudonut a structure element which is important for uh, a frame shift on the uh, translation of the ORF1AB. Uh, although the side of the uh, open uh, frame shift element does not have hint for strong enrichment of modification, but with just more less than 50 uh, 100 bases and the downstream of the modification, we see a hint that a uh, uh, site which is has is among the top 1% of the modifications. Whether this has an impact on the frame shift element or not, we still don't know. Uh, could you go please to the next one? Thanks. Uh, with this, I come to the summary of uh, the SARS-CoV-2 RNA modification detection. So one part is like that, uh, is like the modification impact the fate of the protein coding genes, which is, is for the host, for the function of the host. And also it is expected that the, uh, the viruses uh, can hijack this mechanism, which has been proved for some other viruses. 
uh, we used uh, the three biological replicates and uh, we, we did uh, the sequencing and we identified the conserved modification patterns. And uh, these modifications of genomic and subgenomic RNAs are in the context of the regular inference, which hints that they can also be used uh, as a potential therapeutic targets. All the bioinformatics analysis has been done in Galaxy and is accessible and reproducible for everyone. As a part of ongoing work, we are working on the methylation inhibitors and also knocked on off uh, modification writers to see how they are impacting uh, the modifications and also the course of infection. This has been a collaboration between University of Freiburg, uh, Freiburg Medical uh, Center, and also University of Frankfurt. Um, uh, also, the work is uh, available on BioArchive. Uh, with this, I would like to thank you for listening. So please thank you, Melody. Uh, I guess I'll take over and talk a little bit um, about some of the proteomics works that we have been uh, working on using Galaxy workflow in COVID-19 uh, mass spectrometry data sets. So uh, I'm Pratik Jaktap. I'm from University of Minnesota from the Galaxy P team. And uh, along with Subina Mehta, we'll be presenting some of the work that we have been uh, performing for last um, few months. So to start uh, and kind of give an idea about um, the status of uh, COVID-19 diagnostics way back in 2020 or in the summer of 2020, there were quite a few molecular tests that were ca carried out, uh, especially to detect um, uh, SARS-CoV-2 from, from, uh, from patients. And uh, therein, most of the research was done using nucleic acid detection, wherein sample was collected from, uh, from patients and then RNA it was extracted from that, and then it was amplified using PCR, and then you know it kind of give you an, gave you an idea whether the uh, the patient had any viral load of uh, active SARS-CoV-2 infection. Uh, there were also other tests like antibody tests that were available, uh, and this was um, more in order to understand whether there was uh, any previous exposure to SARS-CoV-2 uh, in the sense if there were antibodies that were uh, present against this. Um, uh, against the virus. Uh, so these were the two methods that were available, uh, you know, in, in summer or even fall of uh, 2020. But then uh, there was some push in terms of using mass spectrometry methods to, to detect uh, some of the peptides or proteins that are present uh, expressed by the, uh, by, by the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So um, as you uh, might be aware, um, uh, mass spectrometry basically uh, involves uh, or proteomics methods basically involve taking in protein sample, uh, digesting it into uh, peptides, and then detecting using mass spectrometry methods so that one can generate a spectrum as, it, as has been shown here. And then based on that spectrum, one can identify whether that particular peptide is present or not. So with this, there were uh, quite a few uh, data sets that started becoming available. And most, some of these were from clinical samples. So there was a data set from uh, from uh, from Germany, uh, from uh, Andrea Sin's lab, wherein they uh, took in some samples uh, from saline gargling samples from uh, from from patients who were suffering from uh, COVID-19, uh, and then there were some uh, samples that were available from the nasopharyngeal swab samples, um, and then again, uh, you know, so there were some uh, so some methods that were available wherein one could try to detect uh, uh, COVID-19 peptides from these samples. Uh, there was also an early attempt uh, in uh, April of 2020, wherein uh, researchers tried to look at the genome of uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, genome and then tried to find out what are the open reading frames and hence proteins that could be expressed by these. And so there was an in silico approach wherein researchers tried to determine uh, very early, trying to find out what could be vaccine candidates or even could be uh, diagnostic markers that could be used for a targeted detection using mass spectrometry. Uh, there were also other data sets wherein cell culture methods were used. So uh, researchers basically took in, um, uh, by, to, uh, took in virus cell line samples and then they were infected with uh, SARS-CoV-2 and then uh, eventually, the, the idea was to follow the life cycle of these uh, SARS-CoV-2 infected cell lines and try to find out what was the response of these host cells to uh, viruses. So there were, there were these three kinds of data sets that were available. And 
uh, while these data sets were getting available, we were wondering on what, you know, are, are, are there any methods that we can use to uh, kind of detect some of these peptides? And that's when Beyond uh, Gruning reached out to us and he mentioned that there are a few data sets that he has started putting up onto the uh, Galaxy EU server uh, in order for some proteomics researchers to start uh, developing workflows. And we immediately started talking with him and his team and we uh, started analyzing these data sets. So um, as you can see here, there were quite a few clinical data sets that started getting published. Uh, I mentioned the gargling solution sample as well as the nasopharyngeal swab, swab samples. There were also these respiratory tract samples from um, from Carvalho lab in Brazil, and then uh, quite a few samples from uh, on the uh, bronchial alveolar lavage fluid and lung samples from uh, terminal patients um, or terminal Ill, Ill patients um, from uh, from China as well. So there there are quite a few data sets that were available, uh, and not only they were present from the upper respiratory tract, but we also, as you can see, the, the, some, some samples from lung as well as from lung tissue, as well as from uh, from uh, bronchial alveolar uh, lavage fluid. Um, and then there were quite a few cell culture samples. Um, as you can see here, uh, most of them coming from Urban God Lab from, uh, from France. Uh, and so we uh, had a, you know, a, a, a rich, uh, uh, range of uh, data sets that we could start analyzing and uh, so most of these data sets that have been analyzed and the workflows that have been developed have eventually been deposited on this website here and you know any of these uh, links and these these pxt numbers are basically proteome exchange uh, id numbers uh, that have been mentioned here uh, so what we will be doing today is sorry what we will be doing today is um, basically uh, Subina will be giving a presentation on uh, looking at the proteome, uh, the, the COVID or the SARS-CoV-2 proteome that uh, we identified, the peptides that are presented in this from these various samples. Uh, and this um, work was uh, led by Andrew Ratchewski and he uh, has already uh, submitted this as a preprint. And later I will be talking about some of the work that we uh, that we did using um, some of the metaproteomics workflows to identify other microorganisms that are present in these clinical samples. So with that, I will ask Subina to present the next set of slides. Um, thanks, Prateek. Uh, hello, all. Uh, my name is Subina Mehta, and I'm going to talk about the uh, workflows we developed uh, within the Galaxy platform that helped us generate uh, the optimal peptides for COVID-19 diagnosis. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, now for determining the optimal peptides that would make the detection of these uh, viral peptides in human samples in a clinical setting uh, more feasible and in order to uh, evaluate our workflows, uh, we decided to examine few publicly available proteomics data sets at, as Pratik just mentioned. Uh, we chose three uh, cell culture-based studies and five uh, clinical uh, studies data sets. Uh, the proteome exchange IDs, as you can see in green, uh, were used for our peptide panel generation uh, uh, workflow or the database search workflow. And the ones marked in red are the data sets we used for uh, the COVID-19 peptide validation workflow. Uh, the cell culture data sets are, are SARS-CoV-2 infected uh, viro cell lines uh, from chlorocebus uh, primates, and it was used to generate a high resolution uh, mass spec data. And um, the ones on the clinical samples are the data sets that we obtained from oronasal pharyngeal samples uh, or gargling solution samples or from the bronchioalveolar uh, lavage fluid samples or uh, lung tissues from infected patients. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this is the first uh, database search workflow where we uh, generated the peptide panel that we wanted to look at. Uh, the Galaxy workflow for the peptide uh, panel generation of peptide identification workflow includes uh, conversion of raw files uh, to MGF, uh, which is the MSMS data. Um, 
In case of the cell culture study, the MGF uh, files were searched against the uh, combined database of fluorocebus uh, sequences, the contaminant database, and the COVID-19 sequence database. Uh, with respect to the clinical uh, samples, we use the human unipro protein sequence uh, contaminant uh, database and the COVID-19 sequence database as our combined database. Now, uh, for the sequence database searching, we use SearchQuery Peptide Shaker. Uh, within SearchQuery, uh, we use three different search algorithms, uh, the MSGF Plus, OMSA, and Xtandem. Uh, which helped us uh, produce some peptide spectral matches and then followed by some false rate, uh, false discovery rate uh, and protein grouping analysis using peptide shaker, we obtained a peptide report. Now, these peptide report contains the peptides that were identified uh, from, the, from the MSMS data. Uh, we further continued a filtering process in which we extracted only uh, peptides that were COVID-19 specific. Now, to validate whether these uh, the presence of these COVID-19 peptides, we performed a PEP query analysis, uh, which uh, told us whether these strands are present or not. And now, once we validated the presence of these peptides, we extracted the confident peptides from the PEP query results. Um, next slide. Uh, once we performed the database uh, search workflow, we performed another validation workflow, which is a complementary method to our initial database searching method, uh, to which we com confirm whether the peptide spectral matches that we found were uh, validated or not. Uh, from our previous workflow, we obtained about 630 peptides. Uh, and as Pratik mentioned before, there were some in silico uh, generated data sets uh, wherein we had nine unique peptides. So we added these nine unique peptides to the 630 peptide and got 639 COVID-19 specific peptides. Now we performed our validation study using a PEP query on the clinical data sets. Um, so for that, the database we used were the SARS uh, related protein sequence database, the human Unipro and the contaminant database. And we searched our um, MSMS data uh, with this. So from PEP query, we obtained uh, the high confident peptides. And once we obtained these high confident peptides, we did not stop over there. We wanted to also confirm that these peptides that we obtained are of good quality or not. So for that, we looked at the spectral annotation. Uh, for performing this step, we used the uh, multi-omics visualization platform, which is within Galaxy, uh, and it has a lorry key visualization. So we looked at the spectra of these peptides uh, in that. Uh, and once we saw that the peptides were of good quality, we created a final peptide list. Uh, now, our workflow also includes uh, additional or optional inline characterization of these peptides. For that, we performed uh, some BLASP analysis, uh, UNICEF analysis, and also a MetaTrip uh, 2.0 tool analysis, where we looked at the taxonomic uh, lineage of these peptides and to uh, understand whether they are corona uh, sars cov specific or not. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, in this, uh, we are showing the list of peptides that were um, detected uh, as well as validated by our first workflow uh, on the three clinical uh, data sets. Uh, and you can see that the detected peptides span uh, throughout the coronavirus uh, SARS-CoV-2 proteome. Uh, most of them are identified in the nucleocapsid region uh, and spike protein, uh, also the membrane protein, but there are several other non-structural proteins that were also identified by our workflow. Um, next slide, please. Now, uh, in order to determine that uh, the optimal candidates for the uh, detection of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, using the clinical uh, uh, mass spec based studies, uh, we focused on the peptides that passed the PEP query uh, with highest confidence, and then we looked at the spectral quality. So we therefore uh, sorted our results from PEP query analysis to include those only with the highest confidence. 
which we did said that okay was that if it's a threshold of 0 0.000 p value of less than 0001 then it is of highest confidence so if you look at the uh, graph uh, most of the uh, if we keep a p value of 0 0.05 uh, we obviously validate more peptides uh, using pep query uh, but if you increase the p value uh, reduce the p value to 0 0.0001 then we find out that there's a quite a reduction in our uh, peptides that are validated using pep query so we thought that if we increase uh, we if we put the p value of less than 0 0.0001 then the spectral annotation would also be a good one but we also noticed that there's a vast difference between the peptides that are validated in the upper respiratory tract compared to the deep lung tissue. And also the PSMs of the SARS-CoV-2 peptides in the upper respiratory tract were of higher confidence compared to the deep lung datasets. And you can also see that most of the peptides that we uh, were from the nucleocapsid and the spike protein region. Next slide, please. Now, um, in order to understand more about the peptides that we identified uh, using pep query, uh, we created this circus plot within the Galaxy pla uh, platform showing that the, the protein assignments of the detected and validated SARS-CoV-2 peptides. Uh, here in the outer ring, you can see the SARS-CoV-2 uh, proteins um, from uh, uh, the entire proteome. Uh, in the second ring uh, inside, uh, uh, we show the 639 peptide panel list uh, that we created, uh, developed from our first workflow. The third ring are the peptides that we identified uh, using our validation workflow in both the clinical as well as the cell culture data sets. The fourth ring, uh, or the second innermost ring, are the peptides that um, we identified only in our cell culture data sets. Uh, and the innermost ring the, uh, are the peptides, are the final peptides that were uh, chosen for the targeted analysis. And uh, these peptides uh, are where then uh, we then perform spectral annotation on these peptides. Um, next slide, please. So, uh, here is the MSMS spectra of the SARS-CoV-2 peptides that we uh, most that we confidently identified using the PEP query uh, p-value of less than 0 0.001 across most of the clinical samples. Uh, the spectral quality uh, was interrogated using uh, the Laurie Keith viewer within the multiomics visualization platform, as well as the PDV viewer from Zang Lab. Uh, and as you can see, the spectral quality here is quite good. Uh, and we noticed this, uh, that these peptides were of very good quality across all the clinical samples that uh, we were analyzing. Next slide, please. Now, uh, once we determine that uh, these four peptides are of high confidence and we would like to know more about this, so we performed some taxonomic analysis using the MetaTrip uh, 2.0 tool uh, to validate the specificity of these uh, four high quality confidence peptides uh, to the coronaviruses that are present. And we um, found out that these peptides were uh, mapped to the proteomes of several other coronaviruses along with the SARS-CoV-2. Uh, but it had matching, most matching to the bad coronavirus also. Uh, so to gauge this uh, degree of specificity of the uh, peptides to the SARS-CoV-2, we uh, wanted to perform further analysis. So for that, we performed blast seed of these peptides against the proteomes of uh, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, and humans and other eight known pathogenic human coronavirus, as Milad just mentioned. Uh, each of the uh, four distinct peptides that uh, sh we are showing showed uh, that they are matching to the nucleocapsid uh, proteins uh, across all the other coronavirus, but it shows 100% homology to the uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, coronavirus sequence. 
the first peptide sequence, as you can see, uh, showed perfect alignment to the SARS-CoV-2 nucleocapsid uh, uh, protein, but with no alignment to the same protein in any other uh, coronavirus sequences. Uh, so which actually gave us more confidence on these uh, four peptides that we uh, demonstrate that these are of high quality uh, and these can be used for diagnosis. So uh, in conclusion, uh, we, uh, uh, oh, also in all the cases we noted that none of these uh, peptides match to any of the human uh, proteins. So in conclusion, uh, we wanted to show that these four peptide panelists are specific to SARS-CoV-2. Uh, also based on the testing, uh, based on testing, both the cell culture as well as the clinical data sets are two workflows. Uh, the peptide panel generation or database searching workflow and the validation workflow uh, identified uh, peptides throughout the SARS-CoV-2 uh, proteome uh, with extracting only those peptides that were high, of high quality using PEP query scoring and manual spectra integration. We reveal these four confident peptides, uh, which can be used for uh, proteome uh, conducting targeted proteomics experiments. Uh, we also want to share our observation that the deep lung samples may not be uh, suitable for detecting the COVID-19 um, by targeted clinical proteomics experiments. Uh, with that, I wanted to I would conclude our COVID-19 proteomics research. All of these uh, data that we just mentioned uh, and our case study is published in the COVID-19 Galaxy project page. Uh, now. Uh, I would uh, like Pratik to share some more information about the meta proteomics research that we conducted on the COVID-19 uh, infected patient samples. Over to you, Pratik. Thank you, Sabina. So uh, again, switching gears, um, the earlier proteomics workflows that uh, Subina mentioned uh, were basically looking at you know SARS-CoV-2 presence or COVID-19 uh, in, in COVID-19 either patient samples or cell culture samples um, and what we kind of decided to do was go beyond uh, looking for just SARS-CoV-2 uh, peptides and try to see if there are any uh, microorganisms or microbial uh, peptides that we could detect in these infected samples and the reason why we started to do this was but there has been quite some literature available uh, which has suggested that apart from COVID-19, uh, uh, apart from the SARS-CoV-2 that is present in lung samples during COVID-19 infection, uh, there could be other microorganisms that could be uh, present and uh, having a, a pathophysiological effect on, uh, on, the, on the progression of the disease, um, especially given that the immune as well as the, the lung functioning has been uh, severely um, uh, suppressed or has been affected because of this uh, infection. So there are quite a few papers. Um, and then uh, it, one of the things that has been shown uh, in during this co-infection has been that uh, it does have an effect on the diagnosis as well as symptoms or even treatment and has also uh, been responsible for uh, some of the deaths that occur uh, even after the a patient has recovered from COVID-19, uh, you know, the true viral infection. Uh, then it, the, the reason why these uh, infections could be occurring could be, uh, it could be because uh, maybe the the patient already had some infection, it, which, which got worse when, uh, you know, after uh, having COVID-19 symptoms, uh, or it could also be that uh, these could be uh, acquired during hospitalization. There have been studies that have showed that after four or five days after one acquires COVID-19, there are bacterial infections that start uh, occurring. And, and you know there are some examples that have been shown here, not only in terms of bacteria, but also viral as well as fungal infections. Uh, nosocomial infections, that is infections uh, that occur in hospitals are typically uh, notorious for uh, being uh, antibiotic resistant, uh, which means uh, the medical team has to put in an antibiotic treatment plan to treat uh, this bacterial infection. So that also becomes an important part. And one of the uh, problems due for detection of these um, microorganisms has been uh, that, you know, some of these methods are culture-based methods, which sometimes take a few days or sometimes a few weeks uh, for these bacteria to grow and uh, confirm the presence of this disease, by which time the disease has progressed much further. So 
we, we thought maybe we could uh, start looking at some of these data sets and develop a workflow that could be used for uh, detecting microorganisms in the sample. So uh, one of the things that we did was, so the, the three data sets that Subina mentioned earlier for, that we use for COVID-19 samples, we use the same data sets. Uh, but here, instead of looking at just SARS-CoV-2 samples, we decided to look at, um, you know, what are the other organisms that are present. So for this, we use the raw files, the mass spectrometry files, and used a program called as Compil 2.0, which basically looks at a large uh, database, almost the entire uh, number of sequences that are present in the UniPro database or the UniRef database, and uh, helps you to get an output uh, of the peptides that are present in the sample. So, so remember here, you do not need to know what uh, what organisms are present in this sample. You, you're basically searching it against a large database and that basically helps you to identify these, um, the peptides that are present. So once we identified these peptides uh, using a Galaxy workflow from the output that is generated from Compil 2.0, we subjected to Unipept analysis and uh, we selected uh, only those organisms which had at least two peptides identified and which were clinical significant, uh, and then generated a protein FASTA file uh, using UniPro um, uh, FASTA uh, database generation methods in, uh, available in Galaxy. Uh, we generated a database which has got human proteins and these uh, UniPro FASTA for these organisms as well as uh, SARS-CoV-2 proteins, um, and then searched this uh, using search GUI and peptide shaker, the same, um, uh, tool that uh, Subina had mentioned earlier. And then we identified these peptides and then we subjected them again to Unipept analysis to identify microbial peptides and then validated these peptides using PEP query method. And then as a last uh, step, just to be sure that whatever that we are identifying are indeed good uh, spectral samples, we perform lorikeet analysis uh, to look at these, uh, uh, you know, pretty protein peptides that are present in the sample. Uh, we have published this study uh, at the beginning of this year um, as a letter to the Journal of Proteome Research, um, which you can, uh, you know, you can access um, uh, through this link here. So some of the um, kind of highlights of these samples were, for, for example, for the gargling solution sample, we identified streptococcus pneumonia uh, and lactobacillus rhamnosus along with the SARS-CoV-2 peptides in this sample. So remember, these were identified with at least two peptides and with a high confidence uh, spectral validation uh, method as, uh, as as was described earlier. Um, streptococcus pneumonia has been shown uh, by other methods as well to be a co-infecting uh, microorganism present in uh, COVID-19 samples and it causes pneumonia, uh, especially in the uh, respiratory tract uh, uh, infection. In the oro nasopharyngeal tract sample, which had both COVID positive samples, uh, COVID positive patient samples as well as COVID negative patient samples, we identified quite a few organisms uh, out of which uh, the Pseudomonas species uh, BCH, which has not yet been identified as a pathogenic organism, was found in high amounts in a, in a COVID positive sample. While we also found Pseudomonas montelli and Acinobacter uh, ursungi from COVID, uh, COVID negative samples, um, and these have been shown to uh, cause meningoencephalitis as well as bacteremia. Um, in, in, in patients. In the third sample, we found only SARS-CoV-2 samples, uh, peptides, though we did identify peptides from other organisms, but we haven't reported them here because we found them either with a single peptide or the peptide validation was not as, uh, or the uh, spectral validation was not um, up to the threshold that we had set. So here is an example of some of the organisms uh, that were detected. And as you can see, um, you know, these are just representative samples, but we could, you could see that they have excellent uh, coverage of, um, of the spectra that we, uh, or, uh, that we looked at. So um, in conclusion, and again, this is a conclusion for both uh, the COVID-19 proteomics uh, workflows that Subina described, as well as the metaproteomics samples that I described. Uh, there are now Galaxy workflows that are available for analysis of co these COVID-19 mass spectrometry data sets, and you know you can access them using uh, the link here. Um, we could detect peptides that span the entire SARS-CoV-2 uh, proteome and kind of justified our reasoning for not only using clinical samples, but also using cell culture samples, because then we got a much more comprehensive coverage of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 proteome um, since you know, it covered various life cycle uh, or various stages of the life cycle of, of, uh, of the virus. 
Uh, Metaproteomics analysis identified potential co-infecting microorganisms in COVID-19 patient samples. And our next steps are, um, we're going to look at the bulb sample, the bron bronchial alveolar lavage fluid sample, as well as lung tissue samples, and try to see if we identify any microorganisms there. Um, because uh, as um, I mentioned earlier, these samples were from uh, patients who unfortunately uh, uh, died due to uh, coronavirus. So these were terminal uh, samples from terminal patients. Uh, and we would like to see if uh, there was anything that indicated uh, or could indicate uh, the cause of death uh, due to secondary infection. Um, with this, I would like to kind of conclude uh, this talk and say that if you are interested, you can definitely go and um, you know visit any of these resources here. Uh, all of these data sets are available here and we'll be adding at least uh, one or two more to this uh, list of data sets. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge the various uh, researchers that we work with, uh, especially Peter Thoibon and uh, Dennis Volan from Scripps Institute who helped us in performing the COMPIL 2.0 analysis and beyond grinning for uh, basically initiating this uh, uh, in, in in May of 2020, wherein he reached out to us and said, let's let's see what we can do. And we kind of almost got um, uh, interested in this and have expanded from, you know, from a few uh, data sets to almost 10 data sets that we analyze now. Now, I'd also like to uh, thank Andrew Ratswesky, who's a, a, a PhD student in, in Griffin Lab, uh, who has led the work on the COVID-19 uh, proteomics data set. Um, also, Timothy Griffin, who's the PI of the Galaxy P grant, um, and whose guidance we have um, kind of worked on developing these workflows. Uh, 